Nottingham Forest podcast brought to you by Nottinghamshire Live. Hello, welcome to Garibaldi Red as we are here to discuss a fantastic night for Forest uh, as they beat Arsenal again in the FA Cup, not for everyone, but Forest did it in impressive style and are basically on the march and looking good as we head through January where they've been busy in the transfer market as well. And to discuss all that, we're joined first of all by Reds legend Gary Bertels. Hello Gary, you well? Good morning, yeah. After last night, definitely. Yes, absolutely. We'll get into that massively in a minute. And uh, second guest today is Reds fan Mikey Clark. Hello, Mikey. You well? Morning, Matt. Yeah, I'm fantastic. Thank you. Are you? Yes. Uh, oh, absolutely. After last night, as Gary said. I mean, let's let's get straight into last night then, Gary. Um, I mean, you, you know, it's not always been positive on this podcast when things have been bad at Forest, but it's good at the moment. And last night was probably as good as it's been for a, a long time. What did you make of it all? Um, after the last couple of results, you know, when it's not gone for us uh, quite as we'd expected. You didn't know what to expect yesterday. You didn't know what side Arsenal were going to play, but whatever side they did play, it was going to be a strong one because they are a Premier League side. They're one of the form teams in the Premier League at the moment and they would have been expecting to win. And uh, I, I really enjoyed the fact that Arteta was really angry afterwards and told as it, as it was, you know, as Steve Cooper does when things don't go right. Uh, it was nice to hear a Premier League manager saying that's not acceptable. Uh, Forrest deserved it. They didn't have a shot on target, Arsenal. This is a Premier League team we're talking about, and they didn't have a shot on target in 90 minutes. And I just thought they did all the hard work in the first 45 minutes, which you have to when you play a Premier League team. Because if you start wrong and you start with you know no confidence and no concentration, you can find yourself a couple down within you know, 15, 20 minutes. So it was vital that didn't happen. And it was, you know, the, the selection was interesting as well. I was I was very interested before I saw the selection as to what it would be. And, uh, yeah, it, he was, you know, Steve was brave, brave enough to, you know, play players that have only just come in and uh, it worked. Yes, we'll come on to half time and what was said at half time later. But um, in general, Mikey, just the atmosphere and the occasion and what it said to what Forest are and what they can be in terms of actually being, been a massive football club. And it was a nice reminder for the national audience to see, to see what they are, wasn't it? Mm, yeah, it, it was a, it was a brilliant evening, really. Um, I kind of echo what Gary said, you know, I was a bit apprehensive, didn't really know what to expect coming off the back of a couple of, couple of defeats, albeit one of them really unlucky. Um, Arsenal, I think Arteta spoke in the build up about, some of the problems this squad have, uh, obviously, with the COVID situation. So we, so we didn't really know the opposition. But I think Gary's spot on. What was going to happen was there's going to be millions and millions of pounds worth of talent on that football pitch, regardless of what teams uh, were put out. And I was just really, really pleased. You know, we're going to talk a bit, I would imagine, about the second half and the goal and how we sort of took control of the game. But the first half for me, and I know we got a bit of a panning on TV at half time, but I don't know what more we could have done because if you open up against a team like that, you could find yourself, as Gary said, two or three nil down after 10, 15 minutes and the game's over. So I thought tactically we were absolutely brilliant. We stayed in the game. Um, and then in the second half, we became a little bit more expansive, uh, you know, and, and got that goal to, got the goal to win it. But I just thought it was a wonderful evening. You know, as you said, Matt, great reminder of what we're all about, um, you know, national TV audience, ITV, Sunday night. I, you know, I've not seen the viewing figures, but you've got to think it'd be a few million watching us, uh, you know, and the, and the general sort of feeling that, that you get checking social media and talking to people after the game is one of, oh, this is Nottingham Forest. This is what we're all about. And it just kind of speaks to where we could be, fingers crossed, um, in the all too distant future, fingers crossed. I thought... Like you say, Mikey, I think you're spot on about how Forrest went about it. Keenan Davis set the tone for me, the way he really went after Rob Holding. There was that bit on the touchline where he got right in his face. What did you make of him from a striker's point of view, Gary? It was a good first impression, wasn't it? I enjoyed watching him. I, you know, I was really interested to see what he'd bring to the, uh, the the Forest setup, And he looked a little bit rusty at times, which you'd expect. Um, but I think he grew into the game and he made it really difficult for defenders. You know, he was awkward. He was, you know, he's backing in. He was leaving his foot in at times. And uh, I, I just thought, yeah, he's a different outlet for us. You know, from Taylor and from Graben, 
you know, you'll head the ball, you'll hold the ball up. And, uh, you know, I thought, I thought, yeah, I'm enjoying what I'm seeing here. And uh, it looks a decent addition to the squad, without a doubt. Yes, as Lyle Taylor's biggest fan, Mikey, you must have been disappointed to see Keenan get the start. I mean, what did you, what did you, that's facetious, obviously, if anyone's yeah. wondering. Um, what did you make of Keenan then, Mikey? I uh, I made a point of uh, keeping an eye on him for that first 10, 15 minutes. And uh, every time I won a header, I sort of chalked it off because I'm a bit sad like that. And he won four of the first five headers and nine of the first 10. So as Gary said, he provided that focal point for us. Uh, stayed on his feet, held the ball up, ran the channels when he could. And I think kind of more importantly, if the ball's constantly coming back at you, it kind of forces you back as a team. And you, you see that as fans and you watch it. If the ball sticks up front, it allows you to take that breather and maybe push a little bit up the pitch. And I think what he did really, really well was, like I said, he gave us that focal point. He, he didn't allow Arsenal just to win the ball back straight away and launch sort of wave after wave of attacks. Um, he did exactly what I would have thought Cooper wanted from him. And I, I think I said before the game um, to you, Matt, if we can give him sort of 60, 65 minutes, um, embed him into the team, understand the way he plays as well as the way we play, uh, and then maybe if we're still in the game, get somebody like a grabber on to, to try and nick it, it almost ticked every box. And I thought he was... I thought he was a, a proper unit, for want of a better phrase. I thought he did really, really well. It'd be interesting to see whether he gets a start at Fulham, actually, uh, at Millwall, sorry, at the weekend. That'd be very interesting. What do you think, Gary? Well, I'd go with Graben still. What would you do? Well, it's a difficult one, isn't it? I mean, Lewis proved, you know, what he's capable of when he came on. You know, <laughs> you get a chance like that, you know, he'll put it away. Um, that's what you want to see from Lewis. But um, I think... What we saw previous to Lewis coming on was the work rate and, you know, the general awkwardness of him, you know, in, in engaging defenders, making it difficult for them. Uh, no no centre-halves like playing against players like him. And, um, you know, we, we all know what Lewis is about and, you know, he proved that. And the cross was absolutely magnificent. It, I always moan about people trying to take one more touch and trying to pick somebody out instead of just putting in a, an area where you can attack it. And he did that, Yates. And, you know, he's, he's got the perfect foil to attack it in Lewis Grabbin in those sort of areas. Um, so I, I, I was just imp I was impressed with the first half, to be quite honest, because I think we did the hard stuff in that first 45. We worked hard. The work rate was tremendous, not just as individuals, but as a team. We pressed as a team. And you could see the confidence grow and grow after that in the second half. Then, you know, we just we, we took over the game a little bit and, it was a little bit embarrassing because you expect a little bit more from Arsenal, from a Premier League team, not to have one shot on target in 90 minutes. That speaks volume, volumes for how much work rate we put in as a team. You know, closing down, stopping them playing, pressing non-stop. And that's what we did for 90 minutes. You can't do it for 85 minutes. You can't do it for, you know, an hour or whatever because you'll get punished by the better teams. And uh, I think that overall that was, you know, what I enjoyed most, you know, the work rate, the efforts from everybody involved. And uh, that's why the celebrations were so, I think, special at the end. And now we've just got to knock Leicester out. We'll come on to that. Um, I got a few messages at halftime from journalists who probably watch more Premier League football saying that first half was, was boring. I mean, I didn't think it was. And obviously, Roy Keane said, it, said well, he absolutely slaughtered Arsenal, but said Forrest were rubbish. That Mikey, that was... A, a step too far, I thought. What did you make? Keane's got a brand, but what did you make of it? Yeah, I, th I think you hit the nail on the head. I think he's slightly pandering to to his brand, so to speak. But um, I don't think it was the most exciting first off. But I think I think also you got to you got to temper it with the fact that you know we're all emotionally invested in the game, so we want it to go a certain way. And Forrest setting a stall like that, that made us stay in the game. So for us. It may not have been end-to-end -end or shots on goal, but for us, it was kind of job done and we're still in the game and that sets it up for the second half. But I did think it was a little bit over the top from Keane, to be honest. I don't know what he kind of expected. You know, did we? Did he want us to play open game and be 3-0 down after 20 minutes? I don't know. I think it's... I, I think we just have to have a bit of realism here. You know, you see some teams try and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the better teams and just get punished. Um, and we had a couple of new debutants in the team. 
Um, you know, we're still trying to get used to that formation at the five at the back. Um, you know, it was, it was a big day. Everybody's really ramped up for it. And I just thought we played it tactically perfectly. And, you know, although maybe it wasn't the greatest spectacle, I did think that was a little bit harsh, to be honest. I don't know what, what you think, Gary, but I, I, I thought that was a bit harsh of Keane at half time. Whatever, I think whatever they'd have done first half, if they'd have gone for it and been 3 0 down, he'd have said we were rubbish. But because we were tough to beat and we did all the right things, the hard work, which he demands from whoever he plays for. You know, Roy's, Roy's like that. We know what Roy's, I love him as a pundit. He, he's one of the best for me, him and Sunes. You know, I, I just listen, like listening to them because they say it as it is. But um, he's always demanded the highest quality and work rate from whoever has been his teammates. And if he didn't get that, you know, he would have been straight on the back. And I think it was harsh in respect of the work rate Forrest put in that first 45 minutes. Uh, yes, we all want to see entertainment. Yes, it wasn't massively entertaining, but what do you want? You know, I, I think it speaks volumes for, for Steve Cooper that he put that team out. He wanted to be in the next round. Winning's a great habit. And I, that's why I always get surprised that the changes managers make for the FA Cup and the League Cup. Winning's a great habit. Just put your best team out, if you possibly can, and go and win a football match. Then if you win that football match, the confidence going into the next couple of league games could be immense. It really could. And that could push you forward. It could propel you for the rest of the season to put a real challenge in to get in that top six. So I, I think Steve Cooper needs a, a huge amount of credit for the team he put out and uh, whatever he said at half time, I would have said it was positive because he'd have been delighted to be nil nil at half time because, you know, whatever he said and, and did before the game has worked. And the second half, they just went and, you know, took the game by the scruff of the neck. And I, I was just delighted watching it. I was watching it at my daughter's with about half a, dozen, uh, half a dozen of us watching it. And, you know, we were just on the edge of our seats and we we're jumping around and, you know, just enjoying the game. And, uh, you know, when the draw came out, we've got Leicester at home. That looks like it could be uh, televised as well with a bit of luck. So, yeah, give Steve the, the credit he deserves because it would have been easy just to say, well, we're concentrating on trying to get in the top six in the playoffs. But he wanted to win every football match. And, and, and that's what Brian Clough always did. He wanted to win every match that we played. And he put a strong side out. And, uh, yeah, I was pleased when I saw the actual starting lineup. Yeah, I must say, it's the most emotionally involved I've felt in a game for a long time, kind of reverting to a fan hat more than a, a journo hat. I mean, we said on here quite a lot. I've asked people, what's the last Forest team you liked? And you have to go back a while. And I actually like this team. And it, for so long, I mean, the Hewton era, on reflection, we don't swear on here, but it was shit. Utter rubbish. Uh, it was so passive. Uh, and everything was on the back foot and everything was on the counter-attack. I don't object to counter-attack in football because Leicester won the league that way, so fair play to them. But for Forrest to field a team now that feels like, yeah, we'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you and, yeah, we'll be tactically organised. I mean, as a fan, Mikey, does it? you always have pride in the shirt and the club, but does it feel a bit different now and does it feel like your football club's returned in a sense? Yeah, it does, and I echo what you've just said, Matt. I think, um, was it Paul Art's team of 2002, 2003, that sort of time? That was mm. the last real time I felt totally connected to the club. And then maybe before that, maybe Dave Bassett's team of, what, 97? So you're talking a long time ago. Um, since then, we've had a load of different managers, some of them with completely bizarre tactics, as you were just saying. But I think what Steve Cooper's done brilliantly well is, you know, get the fans on side straight away with some of the words that he uses in, in his press conference. You know, I don't want to speak ill of previous managers, but they always seemed very afraid of the opposition. You know, the opposition's got player X or, you know, player Y, and this is how we're going to counter them. And that, that was seen on the pitch. You know, you, we have a, a number of talented, younger individuals that would thrive in a, in a in an environment where you let them express themselves and I think that's what Steve Cooper's done he's come in and just said Brennan Johnson for example you're good at this get on the right wing get the ball run, run at the defense don't worry too much about anything else you know Ryan Yates look forward you're brilliant in the midfield go past it you know I read something around um he's changed one of his uh offices it's I think it's called the team room now or something so 
something as simple as that, I know it sounds a bit, you know, up your own backside sort of business speak, but it does go a long way because it it, it sort of gets out that all encompassing, we're all in it together sort of manner. And, and I know working in, in big business, if you do that for your team and for your people, they feel more inclined to be expressive and be open and honest. And it, it kind of transcends onto the football pitch as well. So where we've seen in the past, maybe a little bit more reserved football that was a little bit scared. Now you don't see that. When we are on the back foot, it's because we're tactically set up to be that way. And then we, when we express ourselves, we express ourselves. And I think it is a huge thing now, certainly after the couple of years that we've been through, that you know we've now got a team, I think, that fans are really buying into. They're buying into the brand, the way of playing, the players on the football pitch, you know, that, that are representing us in our city. And I think it's a re- real positive time. And then hopefully... You know, the, the, the chairman, the owner is going to back us. So hopefully we can really push on the second half of the season. And you never know what's possible. Because when you've got, and we saw it yesterday, 26,000 people screaming behind you, that's often worth, you know, that puts opposition sometimes on the back foot. It's often worth another goal. I'm sorry to be cheesy, but it's, it, you know, when the fans weren't in the other, other, other year, you saw how <laughs> you saw the impact on the team. And, you know, we saw it last night. The fans got them over the line there as well. So I just think it's 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 looking really, really positive. So let's hope for, you know, a, a good rest of the year and a, a strong end to the season. Mm. I mean, he Cooper met you and um, John McGovern, obviously, Gary. And it was interesting after the post-match interview where I think it was Gabriel Clark who ever said, oh, tonight gives you a reminder of what this club can be. And Cooper cut him off. And said, no, I knew that when I walked in on day one. And it's an honour to be here. And you could see the scale of the club. I mean, he just, just seemed to get it, doesn't he? Massively. Uh, and it's not, you know, any bull or anything like that. It's not just, you know, talking for the sake of talking about that. He, he does realise it and he's bought into it and he's embraced it. I keep using that word embraced. But he has. He's not just the team he's embraced. He's embraced the whole environment of the football club and what it's achieved in the past. And, you know, he wants to be successful. He wants to take it forward. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to say how, how much forward he's taken it already. You know, one point on the board when he comes in, now we're just off the playoffs, beat Arsenal. You know, what, what more can you ask in a short space of time than that? And I, I just love his enthusiasm about everything and uh, the way he goes about his business and the refreshing nature when... He's not happy with what he's seen. He'll he'll tell you that he's not happy, and uh, I think everybody loves that because we're all so fed up of hearing, you know, the babble of uh, I don't know what, what would you call it of managers coming out and just being so predictable and saying like you know Arsene Wenger used to I, I never saw that and all all the rubbish you expect you know it looks like they've all been on courses to say exactly the right things, you know, in, in, in interviews, whereas Steve comes out and says it how it, it how it is. And that's why I was pleased about Arteta. He was clearly very, very angry. He was annoyed that his team had uh, not put up a show because their fans came up in huge numbers. And uh, it's good when you can hear managers, you know, be like that. And he, I mean, I, when we met him, you know, I, I thought, well, you know, what's it going to be like? And, the enthusiasm that was there in those couple of hours was just so evident and you, you just felt good about what was going to happen. I'm not even sure we all expected it to happen this quickly, but the excitement was there because of the way he spoke and because of his backroom team, the way they were as well. And um, I, I'm just delighted. You know, you sit there with a smile on your face instead of a scowl now. And, uh, you know, who'd have thought we'd have been saying that three three months ago? Uh, after the match as well, Steve Cook uh, did an interview with Radio Nottingham and he said, oh, uh, it was a bit emotional. I've not been involved in anything like this before. I mean, you got promoted with Bournemouth, but I suppose we should give a word to Cook, shouldn't we, Gary? A very experienced player. And it's interesting to hear him say that after a move from a club that's played in the Premier League so recently. Oh, yeah. And that's I think that's what Nottingham Forest does to you when you come. I think all the players have been you know, come in, have, have been very surprised. I mean, the, the fan base is just incredible. You know, there were 29,000. Was it 29,000 against Peterborough? Mm. I mean, I was at that game and the whole game was 28,000, I think. You know, there were more than the, the Arsenal game at those two games. You know, that just shows what the club can be capable of if 
if they do move onwards and upwards and fingers crossed get in the Premier League at some point because you know the fan base home and away is just incredible you know you don't get better fans than that every club will say you don't get better fans but you ask opposition teams and players when they come to the city ground they get lifted by it because the volume there is just incredible it, it's they it's impossible for you not to get excited about it. And, uh, you know, I've, I've often said it can help the opposition a little bit because it, it can lift them into performing a little bit better. But it's certainly, you know, fantastic for the uh, the home crowd. I mean, Bournemouth isn't a very big ground anyway. They've not got the, the fan base that Forrest have got. Uh, so for Steve to come out and say that, um, I, I just think everybody's singing off the same hymn sheet. Everybody looks happy in what they're doing. Everybody seems to know what the job is. And, yeah, I, I think the signings so far have been, yeah, particularly good. In the past, we've said, well, who the hell is that? You know, they've come from Olympiacos or some, you know, this time we're saying, yeah, we know about you. We know about you. And uh, I think that's a big difference as well. And, uh, you know, it's not over yet. January has only just started. So who knows what will happen? Um I mean, how impressed were you with the back the back three, Mikey? They look very solid for the first game together. It bodes well, doesn't it? Yeah, my uh, brother texted me at the end of the game saying he's seen enough to know that Cook should play every minute of every game going through. So because he fitted in, as Gary said, absolutely ideally in, in that back three. And, you know, having watched him for Bournemouth, and I know a lot of people listening and watching this, we kind of hope that will be the case because he, he's solid as an experienced pro. I thought he was fantastic. And him, Warrell and McKenna, I'm struggling to think of a better back three than that in the league. You know, that is solid. And when you've got those three behind you, you know, our wing backs of Spence and, and a new guy, I can't pronounce his name, sorry, or um, Colback or whoever, um, they will have uh, security knowing that those three, those three very talented people are behind them and, and, and you know, allows them to get forward more. So... I thought Steve Cook was fantastic. Sorry, Gary, go on. No, Mike, I was just about to say, I completely agree with what you're saying there because when we had Lloyd and Burns, we knew we we could do whatever we wanted, you know, being positive in what we could do because we knew those two would not let anybody pass because they were that good. Yeah, you, know, you got the central midfield to get through first, then you got those two, you know, and you got Viv Anderson and Frank Clark. You know, so as a striker... You feel a, a big freedom in, not, in the knowledge that you've got so many good players behind you and they allow you to do what you do best. And uh, I think we saw that in abundance yesterday. Spence was just outstanding. Um, you know, I, I just thought for, for 90 minutes, he was just terrific. He really was. Um, and it just shows you how important with those three at the back the system is. It's clearly the one Steve wants to play. So if you get all the right players in the right positions with that particular setup, then you know, barring injuries going forward, I've got a big smile on my face. Yeah, go on, Mikey. I was, was going to say, it, I was, yeah, I, I thought you might. No, I, I was going to say a similar thing. I thought um, his performance was outstanding. I've, I've, I've wrote on my notes here. You know, I can't give anybody less than an eight out of ten, and I think he was pushing a ten because he was he was wonderful. I think what, what kind of surprised me a little bit, um, Matt, was it seemed to me, and I might have read it wrong, as if Arsenal kind of targeted him because they put Martinelli on that side. Um, and I think maybe after 10 minutes, <laughs> it was it was obvious he wasn't going to get the better of Spence. And then obviously they take the left back off because he's, he's really struggling. Mm. And then when Tierney comes on, I think Brennan drops maybe slightly deeper for sort of five, 10 minutes. But then kind of realises, don't really need to because Spencer's capable of, of sorting it out. There was one point where I think he, he beat three men, didn't he, in his own half and then got cynically bought down. That's just brilliant. I, I had somebody else text me, who's a Man U fan, saying, who's your right wing back? He's he's amazing. And I said, oh, no, he's rubbish. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he's... Well, this, this was, this was um, the, the one big failing from the manager, wasn't it? He's given Spence this platform to perform and now everyone knows how good he is, unfortunately. But I, I think yeah. the thing, Matt, as well, he didn't care who he was up against. Martinelli, mm. whoever it was, he was going to do what he does best, what he's capable of. Yeah, respect to whoever you're marking 
you know, who's ever against you, but there was no way he was going to play this fiddle to Martinelli. And I think that that surprised them a little bit. I, I, I think they might have expected him to, to say, oh, right, we're playing against Premier League side. He might not be as ambitious. He might, might not get forward as, as much. But he didn't. He just took the game by the scruff of the neck and for 90 minutes just, just tormented them. I was delighted. Um, a lot of people in the comments are saying, Mikey, we've got to sign him up for a permanent basis. Is that realistic? If Forrest aren't in the Premier League next anything? season? Uh, it's, it's a good question. I think um, at the moment, the the agreement that he stays with us showcases his talents, probably suits everybody, suits Spence, suits his agent, I would have thought, um, suits us. He obviously doesn't want to go back to Middlesbrough at this point. So I think our realistically, our chances of signing him probably depend on whether we go up or not. Um, I think if we do, we've got a great opportunity. But I do think, you know, look at him yesterday, those that have not seen him before, he was the standout player on that pitch. So if you're a, a Premier League team that needs a right wing back and you're watching him, you're thinking, oh, wow, he's got, what, a year left of his contract at Middlesbrough? What are you, 21? You know, he's, he's, he's going to attract a lot of suitors. But like I said, you know, he was the first in that melee when we scored. He was horizontal, wasn't he, in the middle of that pack? So he's clearly loving life down down with us. So if we go up, who knows? But I think realistically, it probably does depend on us going up. Um, another player who's in the spotlight, Gary, was Brennan Johnson, who, who gave another reminder of his talents. I mean, what did you make of his performance? Again, uh, he plays without fear, doesn't he? Um, he's told by the manager what to do. The same as Spence, really. I think it's a going back to Brian Clough era. He wasn't, I've said this before, he wasn't interested in what you couldn't do. He was only interested in what you could do. And you can see the confidence in every player out there that they're being given that freedom to go and express themselves. And he, he does that on, you know, every occasion he's out on the pitch. Yeah, he's not going to get it right every time, but he backs himself every time, which, you know, is the impressive thing for one so young. Um, we should talk about the goal, really, as well. I know we've touched on it, but um, let's talk about the finish, Gary. I mean, that you know, you, it's good ball, but you have to admire the work from grabbing to get in the right area and put it away. People say, "Well, it was an easy, yeah," but you have to get, you have to gamble, you have to get in at the right time, you have to time your run particularly well. And he did all that, and you knew when it came came to him that that was his sort of service that he, you know, he, he thrives on. And let's let I'll, I'll say something else that would have been easy to miss because the pace that it came in there, the cross was pretty decent, and you know what a massive opportunity were in your own mind when it's coming your way. So it's easy to get it wrong. You know how many times have you seen people? You know the top players, you know the um, Harry Kane's and people like that miss chances in those sort of circumstances. So the fact that he got in there was brave enough to get in there after just not not long being on the pitch and, and finishing it as he did. He let it come on to him. He didn't really... If you throw yourself at it sometimes, that's the wrong thing to do because that's when it can go wrong. If you relax a little bit, which is difficult in those sort of circumstances because you know that could be the, the, the winning goal. Uh, I, he did that brilliantly for me. And um, whenever I hear people say, well, that was, it was just an easy goal, you know, it was only six yards out or whatever, believe me, they are not easy when they come in like that. You have to get your body shape right. You have to get in the right position and make sure it goes over that line any way you possibly can. And uh, I just think, well, I hope they don't sit back on the laurels now and think, right, you know, we've, we've beaten Arsenal, we've got Leicester in the next round. I don't think Steve will let that happen. But it'd be interesting to see uh, the Millwall game now and uh, see what's what happens in that. Uh, we should give a word to Ryan Yates as well, Mikey, I suppose, yeah. shouldn't we? I mean, a fantastic cross. Uh, and a reminder for all the, the the haters that he's he's a good player, and he got about the Arsenal midfielders and made life difficult for them as well, didn't he? He, he did, yeah. And I was going to say same thing. So when he wins the ball, it hits him in midfield. He then goes on the overlap outside Johnson. Going back to our previous point, I'm not sure he would have done that 
under previous managers, certainly not the last one, that, as Gary said, you know, the freedom to express yourself is, is evident for all to see. And I thought, again, him and certainly Garner as well in midfield, who I thought was was really good yesterday. And he's he's upped his game in recent weeks. Um, I thought it was a real solid performance. Two young lads, you know, start, well, I say young, I think Yates is 24, but he's, he's coming into his own now, I think. Um, no, it was just, just really good. Like I said, I mean, I didn't give anybody less than an 8 out of 10. Um, and Yates was probably pushing in on. I thought, it was, I thought it was excellent. And, you know, the goal was brilliant cross. He was all action. And there was a bit right at the end, actually, and going back to Steve Cook, where um, I think Yates went down in the box injured. I think it was Yates. And uh, they were just about to take a long throw in. It's an injury time and everybody's back. And Cook goes across. And I tried to make out what he was saying, but it was something along the lines of get up, because if you get treatment, you'll be off the pitch. And then we've got 10 men to deal with this throw in. And that's the sort of mentality that really pleases me to see that. And I think it was Yates who got up and we obviously defended and won. So, you know, just a big, uh, I just think it's great. It's, it's great to see that just, you know, fighting right until the end uh, to try and try and get the win. Mm, mm. I mean, Forrest went 1v1 a lot, didn't they, Gary, in terms of battles? Co- uh, Cooper trusted players to win their individual battles. And um, we should give a word to Jack Colback. He's up against a, an England international who's playing brilliantly in the Premier League in, in Saka. You know, playing that left-sided role, it's not easy, is it? He did it very well. He did incredibly well, and his concentration levels were impressive for me. It's easy to get switched off, you know, when you're playing against somebody like that. You can be afraid, and you think, "Well, what's he going to do? Is he going to do this to me? Is he going to do that to me?" But like again, Steve has given them that confidence, that belief to say, "Right, again, it's a cluffism." Um, respect your opposition, but don't think they're better than you. You know, we were always told to respect the opposition. And that's why we did so well against Liverpool for two years. You know, they couldn't beat us for two years. And it's because you went out on that pitch with so much belief. Yes, you respected them because they are, they were magnificent, that Liverpool team. And this Arsenal team, you know, one of the form teams are creeping up into contention for Champions League. And, you know, Arteta's got them firing on all cylinders. And, that, that speaks volumes for how well, I think, as a team we played. Not as individuals. It was difficult to pick anybody out. Well, it wasn't because Spence was... He was the one who you could pick out. But like Mikey said, I don't think you could have given anybody below that eight because everybody con- contributed to what was a, a magnificent win. You look at stats. And the stats can be so wrong. I've never been a stats person, as you know, Matt. But I think we had 30-something percent of possession. And they had the rest. But then you look at the shots column. They didn't have a shot on target in 90 minutes. So the possession didn't didn't worry us, didn't, you know, didn't hurt us. And I, I just, I was just so buoyant after that game. You know, it was just, uh, um, it was just great to watch it. Uh, clean sheet as well, you know, against one of the best teams in the Premier League. Clean sheet. And stopping them having a shot at Bryce Samba, you know, it, it just speaks volumes for the way everybody's thinking now that Steve Cooper's got into his players' minds very quickly. And the response from the players you have to admire because you know what players are like. They, you know, they can take to a manager or they can't take to a manager. And, you know, it can be difficult at times. But, you know, he's given them so much belief and in their own abilities to go out and just, you know, prove what they can do. And uh, no wonder, you know, they've taken to him as they have. I suppose one thing, Mikey, that helps with that is having leaders on the pitch. And I think that's something Forrest have lacked. And I suppose just seeing the game out and game management, I'm going back to Cook here, really. Uh, This isn't an original point, but it's a sign that reminds me a bit of Paul McKenna in terms of someone who can talk players through a game. I mean, that helps, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Absolutely. I think the example I gave was a, a, you know, absolutely nail on the head in terms of what what you want to see as a fan and it does really help and I also notice people like Colback talking throughout the game um you know Warrell and McKenna they never sort of shy of a word Cook's in there now um even the sort of front half players they're far more vocal than you used to be and you know I've seen Forest teams over the past I'm sure everybody has where you're crying out for a leader or two on that on that pitch to you know, either up the performance levels or just to get them going. Um, I think we've got that now. 
And I think um, whilst we have a uh, recruitment, I guess, policy or a thought process, which says, you know, sign players of, you know, under 26, you know, roughly, you know, with, with a high ceiling that potentially we can make better and potentially sell on if we're still in the second tier. There's a lot to be said for getting in somebody like a Steve Cook, certainly at centre-back, who's been there, done it, played at a high level, uh, can slot into a back three, and as a talker, you know, helps helps the younger players through the game. Um, I just think, you know, having the mix, you know, even when you go back throughout throughout the years, you know, we've always, all the better teams that Forrest have had have always had that mix. I'm sure when Gary was playing, you, you had the, the leaders and the talkers that used to help through through the younger players. And, you know, you love to see that as a fan, definitely. Mm, mm. Is that right, Gary? I guess when you were playing, you didn't have one captain, did you? We had about six or seven, you know, that, that was the beauty of it. You had people who were opinionated for the right reasons, you know, Burns, Lloyd, you know, from the back. Um, and then you had McGovern, you know, the captain. Ian Bowyer was one of the most vocal players I ever played with. And uh, you, you needed players in there in, in all decent areas. Um, you know, we, up front, we didn't, you know, me and Woody hardly said a word. But, you know, <laughs> we just let everybody else uh, get on with it. It were the more experienced players. But... Yeah, it's so important that you see that on a pitch because I think players sometimes tend to hide a little bit and they're, they're afraid to say, you know, things for the sake of, you know, getting stick off other people. Um, I, I, I like to see opinionated players out there. I like to see players that are directing the traffic out there because it shows, you know, the fans, you know, that people care, you know, because, you know, they're the remonstrating with somebody when they've done something wrong. People say, well, leave it in the dress, you know, wait for the dressing room. I don't agree with that. Because if it was done to me, which it, it was on occasions, that would spur me to, to say, right, the next time I'm going to do it right. You know, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of a rollicking sometimes. You know, I, I think it could be um, productive because, you know, if you're the right individual, it'll get to you, it'll annoy you and it'll spur you on even more. And, uh, I like to see that, and I think Cook will be a massive help to quite a few people, not just the defenders, but in the dressing room, around him. You know, people have that respect for him, and it, straight away he's made an impact. And you know, Joe Worrell, I think, will be um, delighted that he's there as well now. You know, the three of them, like Mikey said, are there a better three in that division at the moment? I'm, I'm not so sure there are, but um, you just hope they're all going to be fit. And that system is beholden on the, the wing-backs as well, isn't it? So, you know, we've got to get that right and hope that that stays as it is. Because if you get it right at the back, you'll see that things go very, very positive further up the pitch. Because we've already said, you play with so much more confidence going forward because you're so confident of what's behind you and how good they are at organising and being resilient and... You know, the concentration levels are good because they're played at the top level. And that can only be good and, you know, very productive going forward. I think the, um, I find the man management of Graben really interesting. He's obviously sat down with him and he's put him front and centre of this kind of leadership group. He's kept the captain's armband on him. He's put an arm around him. And to me, Graben looks a bit different to me. He celebrated the goal and he ran off to Yates and it wasn't about him and he looked like he was a real part of the team. Do you see a different player there, Gary, or not? I think you have seen a totally different player since Steve has arrived. Um, he, he looks more of a team player now. He looks, you know, involved in what's going on. He wants to be involved in what's going on out there. He wants to show that, you know, he's got the captain's armband and he is a captain, you know, by... Before, it was just when he wasn't captain, it was just about maybe him and his game. But now I think the responsibility has, has done him good. And, uh, you know, he, he just feels very like he's got to act like a captain and, you know, play a captain's role. As You know, that's why captains are picked. You know, McGovern was, you know, the perfect captain. You know, captains are picked for a reason because you know, the respect of other players that have for them and the, the, what they do out there and lead by example. So, um, yeah, I think it's been, again, a master stroke by, you know, Steve Cooper to, to do that because strikers, I don't think, always make good captains because, you know, you're isolated at one end of the pitch a little bit and you can't see what's going on. That's why defenders, even goalkeepers, you know, can see the whole picture, whereas a striker can't. 
but you know steve's you know thought about it picked him out to be the man and uh he's got the response he was looking for has he won you over as a captain mikey i think you were on the kind of joe warrell should be captain bandwagon but do you see you see why grab and can wear the armband now yeah i i do and i think partly because of um what you read about what Steve Cooper is trying to do with a group of leaders. So, you know, Joe obviously ran out with the team yesterday and, and Graben came on and got that winning goal. But there are multiple captains in that team now. And I think prior to maybe Steve coming in, I didn't really see that as a fan. Uh, I think Graben's probably, Graben's a really interesting one because by all, all accounts, he's, you know, obviously very well paid and he's coming to the end of his contracts this year doesn't necessarily fit into what we're trying to do our thinking in terms of transfers. But for me, I think he's done enough to to be kept on in whatever capacity, whether that's a, a regular starter or somebody, because of this leadership quality that you, that you guys have mentioned. I think he's, um, I think like a lot of players, he's probably come into his own since Steve and his team have arrived. And you see that, you see the way he's playing, you know, smile on his face. <laughs> A big smile on his face with the interview. Um, and and I, I just think that him and a few others uh, have really stepped up the game in recent months. And I just think, you know, people, some, the cynics will probably say, you know, he might be playing for a new contract and he might be. But I think he's a, he's a key, crucial part of what we're trying to do at this football club at the moment. And I personally would be looking to maybe keep him next season, I think, regardless of what league we're in, because of, because of those qualities that he gives. Um, I suppose, Gary, we should look forwards, like you say. It's always one game at a time. And the next game, if ever a game's going to bring you back down to earth, it's Millwall away. So Forest are going to have to be right back on it, aren't they, on Saturday? They are, but that's where Steve Cook will come into the equation yet again. You know, he knows about, you know, places to go that are difficult. Nowhere's easy to go in the Championship. We know that. Anybody's capable at the moment of beating anybody. And uh, you look at the top of the table, you know, Huddersfield up there and Blackburn up there, you know, maybe wasn't expected, but that's how difficult things can be at uh, championship level. So going to Millwall has always been, because mainly the, the, the fans, you know, they've been, you know, always been hostile. You always know that. And um, yeah, I think the experience of people like Steve Cook, you know, will be a, a big factor in going there and, I'm sure he'll be having a chat with the squad about, you know, getting over the Arsenal game. That's gone now. Forget about it. Don't don't think about the Leicester game. We've, we've got to go to Millwall. We've got to win this game. We've got to get ourselves back in contention and put pressure on those above us. And that's where people like him are, are so important to football teams because he won't let, you know, anybody rest on the laurels. Yeah, it was a great win. Yes, hopefully they you know, celebrated it well, but right, focus again now. That's gone. We've got to beat Millwall. We've got to keep pressure on. And uh, yeah, I, I really hope that's the case. And Steve won't let that happen either. You know, he'll be straight on the case and saying, right, forget about that game. Great, we won it. Yeah, we've got to concentrate on getting ourselves into contention again. And I'm sure that'll happen. How are you feeling about the playoffs, Mikey? I've got my five quid on for the top six. How are you feeling? Have you? I, oh, no, I've not got five quid on. I'm, I put, You've got a bit more or a bit less? On. Well, I put 90p on Forest winning yesterday at 11 to 1. <laughs> so that's probably my extent of betting. Um, but no, I've, I've, I am Big feeling positive. Charlie, 90p. I know, 90p. <laughs> um, I am feeling positive, though. I think, one, because of the form we're in. Um, you know, that Huddersfield game, we could have been playing today and want to score. It was just one of them games. But I think, in general, we're playing some really good stuff. Yesterday was fantastic. And I think also, and I'm going to be honest, if you look at the the teams that are above us, none of them scare me, other than maybe Bournemouth and Fulham, but I think those two are runaway. I think any of them are beatable. And, I, you know, if you're saying to me, could Forrest put a run together better than QPR, better than Swansea, better than, you know, the rest of the teams up there, I'd say yes, absolutely, from, from what you're seeing. So I'm feeling cautiously optimistic I think um, I wasn't expecting Forrest to do much more business, but I think some of the uh, some of the articles that read in the last sort of 24 hours suggest that they might be in the market for one or two more players, which is interesting. So 
that in theory will only strengthen the squad because hopefully long gone are the days of you know, mindless scattergun recruitment. It's now more thought through, you know, targeting players for certain areas to help the squad and the team. And if that continues through 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 the month and we don't lose any of our key players, we're going to end January in a, in a lot stronger position and hopefully be within touching distance of those playoffs. So I'm I'm really you never know what what can happen, but at this moment in time, I'm really positive and nothing nothing around us scares me to be honest. Yeah, I mean they want obviously they've signed Cook Davis and Richie Larea, and we'll ask about Richie Larea in a minute. Um, but they also want Jed Wallace. They want Lee Buchanan, but I think that's a very difficult deal to do. And I, I think they've got a couple of alternative options if Wallace doesn't come off. What do you think about the transfer policy in general, Gary? It seems like it seems well thought at the moment, doesn't it? Well, like I said earlier, you know, previous times you thought, well, who the hell is this coming in? You know, I think we've all been a little bit staggered by the names we've seen coming in. We're expecting to see, you know, people we know and uh, we haven't seen that. And, you know, the championship is such a difficult league that if you, you're not au fait with it and you you come in, you, I think you're a bit surprised by the, um, the frantic nature of it and, um, you know, the pace of it. So I think, you know, bringing people in who know it very well uh, is, is very good indeed. And um, I, I just like what I'm seeing at the moment, the, the thought that's, the thought process that's gone into it. Um, and I, I just see that it being even more positive. And I think the right people are involved in getting the players now. Before, you know, we're always a little bit, well, you know, whose decision was that? And um, I, I think the decision making now has changed and it's making a big difference. And that has to be how it is. You know, the people in charge of the football team, running the football team, picking the football team need to be the ones who are involved majorly in bringing people in. And it certainly seems that's the way at the moment. Yeah, I suppose of all the signings, Mikey, Richie Larey is the kind of, who the hell is he kind of signing on paper? But when you look into it, it makes a lot of sense. He can play where Forrest needs. He's a good age. Financially, Forrest haven't pushed the boat out massively, paying 750 grand for a, an international and a decent side now in Canada. Uh, I mean, we, we haven't seen him play, but does it feel like a, a, an interesting signing? It, it does. I mean, you don't know, dear, do but I think from everything you, you read and, uh, you know, better research that you do, it does, you know, not a, uh, you know, not an outrageous transfer fee, a player with a high ceiling, so to speak. You know, I spoke earlier around, can we make players better? Can we develop them? And if we don't go up, will they have a sell-on fee? This guy, if he does what it says on the tin and what, what you believe, that will be the case with him. Um, he's very highly thought of, isn't he? You know, some of these players they look amazing on YouTube, don't they? Let's be honest. But when it comes to reality, it's not necessarily quite the case. Um this guy, by all accounts, is quick, aggressive, and I think more importantly, can fit into the system that we're trying to play. So if, if Steve does want to go with his back three, I believe this guy can play either side, a wing back, which is, you know, we've really, we, we've basically had to rely on the loan market, haven't we, for that position. We've got a midfielder playing there now uh, and a loan eat. So to get somebody in on a permanent deal that ideally will get better, can play either side, quick, aggressive, kind of ticks all the boxes and, you know, it might not work out, but you can see the thought and the thinking behind it, which I think, you know, Gary was referring to a bit of scattergun, who are these players? Um, yes, we might not know this player, but you can see where he may fit into the team and that's not necessarily been the case in the past. So I'm really hopeful and, you know, what 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 Dane Murphy and his, his team have done so far has been really encouraging. Um, you know, these players making an, an instant impact and you can, like I said, you can see the thinking behind um, getting him in alone or, or the permanent deal. So, yeah, fingers crossed he's another one that hits the ground running and makes a big difference. Right. We covered a lot of grounds. Did you want to come in there, Gary, before I... Start? Yeah, just uh, um, that, that particular signing. I, I said to you earlier, the, the next player, I was looking on the website and he was saying what a signing that could be for Forrest. You know, he said his star in the making... Um, you know, Forrest will be delighted to have him. I can't think who it was, the, the ex-player. I'm not sure it was an ex-Forrest player, but mm. uh, he was very, very positive about him. And, uh, you know, when you, you see somebody like that 
talking about a player coming in, you, you, you lift it a little bit by it. And uh, so far, so good. You know, what we've seen, the players that have come in, and it can only bode well for the, the back end of the season, hopefully. Uh, any other business? I'd like to give you any other business, Gary. Anything else you want to say about anything in general? Um, I don't think there is, actually. Just the Leicester game, you know, hopefully that will be televised. You know, what a great draw that is for everybody as well. Um, you know, we've all, all been talking about the, the best team in the, the, mid, the, the East Midlands. You know, we still think it's us. They still they, they think it's them. It's them at the moment because they're in the Premier League. Uh, they won the FA Cup last season. They've won the Premier League. You know, you can't deny what they've done. And uh, it's great to see, you know, East Midlands football thriving a little bit because it's uh, gone a little bit down the pan of uh, late. And now it's the West Midlands that are, you know, a little bit more uh, in front of us. But, uh, yeah, that, that should be a good... Uh, a good viewing again and uh, yeah looking forward to that yeah two-thirds of the east midlands is doing all right another another third is not doing quite as well um mikey how are you feeling about that fa cup tie before we finish yeah good i was going to mention those of the lot down the a52 actually um yeah really positive for the leicester game um it'll be one i'm going to definitely uh, and you never know you know if we play like that anything's anything's possible but i think you know our next home game 21st derby county so that's that's an absolutely huge one, and it'll be uh, nice to to think that we can put in a very similar performance to what we saw yesterday. Because if we do, then we'll smash them, in my personal personal opinion. So, fingers crossed, we get a positive result at Millwall. Loads of confidence for the Derby game, which I believe is on TV as well, isn't it? So, mm-hmm. uh, let's hope we have another performance to warm the hearts of uh, everybody that's watching as well as in the ground. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a good note to end on. Uh, thanks to everyone who watched along as ever. If you joined us and dropped comments in, and if you're listening on this on iTunes, do give us a good rating and subscribe. Um, hopefully back later in the week. I've got two things planned, but need them to come off. So uh, keep tabs on that. Otherwise, we'll be back uh, this time next week, looking back on the Millwall game. Gary, thank you very much. Appreciate it as My ever. pleasure. And Mikey, thank you very much. Cheers, Matt. Cheers, Gary. Thank you. Yeah, cheers, Mikey. We shall, we shall see everyone soon.